Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from, from the Frontier. It's still cold here in Nairobi, about eight degrees overnight, but it's the chill factor. That's what I keep telling myself, the high altitude. I wonder what it's like in Addis Ababa at this time of year. Let's start with some macro thoughts. I couldn't resist this chart that the stalwart posted. It's a kind of riddle uh, to go and explore quite an extraordinary price movement. Time Warner, of course, is soaring in, our, in after hours trading. That's on the news of the merger uh, with AT&T. Jamie at Reuters, as eerie calm returns to markets, have investors given up on hedging, he asks. And an eerie calm is like a Hallison moment, isn't it? from Latin Alcyone, daughter of Helios and the wife of Sikhs, when her husband died in a shipwreck. Alcyone threw herself into the sea, whereupon the gods transformed them both into Hallis and birds, kingfishers. When Alcyone made her nest on the beach, waves threatened to destroy, us, destroy it. Helios restrained his winds and kept them calm during seven days in each year, so she could lay her eggs. These became known as the Hallison days, when storms do not occur. Today, the term is used to denote a past period that has been remembered for being happy and or successful. The US headline consumer price inflation has risen to 2.8% in May, the highest in over six years but largely expected, so no rise in bond yields. The 10-year remains around 2.97%. It's been here for a while now. Home thoughts, I was indeed most excited to receive these indigenous trees from Base Titanium's tree nursery in Kuala, which was such an eye-opener to visit. Um, uh, have a look at this video I took of my visit and uh, it was of uh, the lady whose, whose passion this is, based at an Kuala Mind Restoration Program Indigenous Tree Nursery video, I called it. And here we have a bareback tree that BASE uh, secured when they, were, when they started their whole mining uh, project and uh, under the term of a special mining lease. And of course, yesterday we were talking about the longevity of their sudden rate of death that we've seen amongst the very old ones. I'm not sure if it's possible to capture an entire era in one image, but Dennis Rodman running a cryptocurrency grift on live TV from the North Korea summit while wearing a MAGA is a serious nominee. And this is the photograph to which Benji Salim was referring. This is Dennis Rodman on CNN from Singapore right now wearing a MAGA hat. I got Potcoin here helping me out, he said. And that really captures the zeitgeist, doesn't it? Just needed him to be eating an avocado. Soccer remains the world's most popular sport and is still growing. More than four out of ten people consider themselves soccer fans, making the game the world's most popular sport. In a Nielsen survey that spanned 18 global markets, 43% of people said they were interested or very interested in the sport in 2017. Basketball with 36% is number two. That's interesting, isn't it? Super essay that The New Yorker has re-uploaded from April 19, 1999, Annals of Gastronomy. Don't Eat Before Reading This by Anthony Bourdain who apparently died a few days ago and actually visited Nairobi not too long ago. And this is something he's written. Good food, good eating is all about blood and organs, cruelty and decay. It's about sodium loaded pork fat, stinky triple cream cheeses, the tender thymus glands and distended livers of young animals. It's about danger risking the dark bacterial forces of beef, chicken, cheese and shellfish. Your first 207 well-fleet oysters may transport you to a state of rapture. They will certainly transport me into a state of rapture, rather partial to oysters. But your 208th may send you to bed with the sweats, chills and vomits. Gastroenteritis, something that I've had a few 
times. Gastronomy is the science of pain, he says. Professional cooks belong to a secret society whose ancient rituals derive from the principles of stoicism in the face of humiliation, injury, fatigue, and the threat of illness. And it's a fantastic essay, well worth reading. Generally speaking, the good stuff comes in on Tuesday. The seafood is fresh, the supply of prepared food is new, and the chef presumably is relaxed after his day off. Most chefs don't work on Monday. Um, love the sheer weirdness of the kitchen life, the dreamers, the crackpots, the refugees and the sociopaths with whom I continue to work, the ever-present smells of roasting bones, searing fish and simmering liquids, the noise and clatter, the hiss and the spray, the flames, the smoke and the steam. Admittedly, it's a life that grinds you down. Most of us who live and operate in the culinary underworld are in some fundamental way dysfunctional. We've all chosen to turn our backs <clears throat> on the 9 to 5, on ever having a Friday or Saturday night off, or on ever having a normal relationship with a non-cook. These portraits were captured in photography studios throughout Kenya, Tanzania and Somalia from the 1890s to the 19. 20s. This is via NPR, and the um, exhibition is on at the Smithsonian. The images offer glimpses into the subjects' lives and have an unusual history. Unbeknownst to the subjects, photographers often turn the negatives from private shoots into postcards for Westerners to sell or send back home as mementos from their East African trips. Um, very powerful ones. Uh, Tanzania, this is J.P. Fernandez photograph taken before 1900, take a look at that. Um, but they really are visually arresting. And then I found this, Peterson Kamwati's Vessels, courtesy of the New York Times. Caught my attention. Political reflections, the BBC asked, a win-win or a Kim-win? And I answered, Kim-win bigly, in my view. The Trump Kim Singapore summit was a pre cooked bromance based on the need of both principles to be known and admired by audiences watching at home, writes David Rothkopf. And he's not wrong. Uh, DPRK's Kim to commit to working toward complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. The, the linguistics is important, right? Because the complete denuclearization would mean, mean the removal. The U.S. presence in the South as well. You've got to note that well. So in that in that regard, nothing was gained by the U.S. side. Furthermore, Trump uh, promised to stop uh, military drills, and the Trump Kim document committed the U.S. to security guarantees, i.e., the establishment of new U.S. DPRK relations. Look at this photograph of Kim and Trump my attention. Then uh, the comparativist uh, says that KJU got it through to DJT how much he hates mock decapitation strikes and regime change ops. That was something I didn't think DJT understood. And then saying arms control wonks says Trump thought he was coming to collect Kim's nuke. Surprisingly, he lowered his own expectations. That there was even a story about him telling Pence and Bolton to STFU, which is interesting as well. Then WikiLeaks very strangely tweeted North Korea's real strategic threat, like other East Asian states, is China. They tweeted. DPRK and China share a long border. China has 50 times population, over 100,000 times the GDP, and is growing at six and a half times a year, they tweeted. I said, a very con curious conundrum of a tweet from WikiLeaks. Air China delivered Kim to this summit, and self-evidently is the buffer state, admittedly a mastiff on a leash which metasized into a golden retriever in 2018. I also reiterated that it's the buffer state between China and more than 30,000 U.S. soldiers parked on their doorstep in South Korea. France is stepping up efforts to counter Beijing's activities in the South China Sea. They too are now conducting a FONOP uh, in that sea. So that's another interesting uh, ratcheting up uh, in the South China Sea. Outstanding essay in the New Yorker about Donald Trump's new world order. This quote got my attention. 
Netanyahu shouted over the telephone to the president's advisors, this is Obama's advisors, and about Iran. This is a nuclear warhead aimed at my crotch, he said. Um, and then talking about how uh, Netanyahu dealt with Obama, and, um, and then uh, Obama felt they used us as a cover to make it look like they were in a peace process. They were running a play, killing time, waiting out the administration. Indeed, they were. And then talking about um, uh, the new relationship uh, when Netanyahu visited the Kushners at their home in New Jersey, he sometimes stayed overnight and slept in Jared's bedroom while Jared was relegated to the basement, um, indicating a very closeness of uh, convergence of interests. Um, and then saying, uh, talking about the Israeli cooperation with Gulf states, which has expanded into the Sinai Peninsula. This is MBZ, MBS, Netanyahu. Um, and saying that Palestinians seem to be the likely losers in the new Middle East, as a senior Arab official said of the strategic alliance war, with or without a peace plan, is happening. A senior Trump advisor said Iran is the reason why this is all happening. Um, well worth reading for. This weekend's G7 summit was the geopolitical equivalent of Trump firing Comey, says the political risk consultant Ian Bremer. Reminder, this is what Trump said in a 1990 Playboy interview. When the students poured into Tiananmen Square, the Chinese government almost blew it. Then they were vicious, they were horrible. But they put it down with strength. That shows you the power of strength. Saudi-led coalition bombing of al-Houthi locations on the outskirts of the port Hudaida um, is being confirmed. Um, and uh, Sterling Root tweets, and so the tragedy escalates. Now what the people of Yemen need on the eve of Eid is an escalation of war and humanitarian crisis instead of a push for peace. And I tweeted, it's a colonial war which cannot be won. This is a historical fact with just one exception. International markets, most important questions going into the FOMC, according to BNP, will a presser take place at each meeting? Will the Fed make any changes to their balance sheet policy? Will the Fed make any adjustment to forward guidance? Will Fed include exit risks in statement? Will Fed move to more flexible inflation target? Even after six rate hikes since 2015 and the seventh on Wednesday, U.S. interest rates remain far too low, according to the Taylor rule, should be at more than 4%, two points above current level. Let's move on to the currency markets. Euro dollar 117.50, dollar index 93.86, Japanese yen 110.64, that's moved. Swiss franc 0.9876, the pound 133.50. The Australian dollar has come off its highs overnight, 0 0.7570. Indo rupee 67.595. South Korean won 1084.39. Brazilian real 371.65. You remember it got as high as 390. Egyptian pound 17.8480. And the rand out of bed, 1339.43. Investors have done an about face on the dollar, says Bloomberg. Have a look at the chart. And here's another one of the dollar index from T commodity. Um, we hit 94.50, we haven't come back yet, but I suspect we might. Euro dollar um, last at 117.49, I'm still looking for 114.50. Gold, that's come off the boil again, 12.94, this chart is from Chi Girl. And it's, if you look at that chart, it's been in the same kind of range for quite a while now. The latest year for which data is available, about $297 billion was spent on renewables, more than twice the $143 billion spent on new nuclear, coal, gas and fuel oil power plants, according to the IEA. Crude oil, this is a one-year chart, we've come off the top, let's see how we behave around here. Emerging markets, as I wrote previously, this has all the ingredients for baking a good old-fashioned crisis, I said. And uh, here's a chart of emerging market GDP from Paul Wallace. And look at South Africa. It's right at the end of the continuum. Here's a blast from the past with former president of Somalia, Mohammed Syed Barre, meeting the North Korean president Kim Il-sung, the current president's grandfather. It's video. It's fantastic. It's from Somali Wayne video. 
Madagascar has new government after court orders, says the president and Tanarivo. Madagascar's president announced Monday that a new government has been appointed following a court ruling which called for a consensus administration to resolve a political crisis sparked by electoral reform. The government of Prime Minister uh, Christian Nitze has now been put in place after several rounds of negotiations. So that's a positive development. Ethiopia is to privatize airlines. Ethio Telecom to ease foreign currency shortage, says the Commission. Um, the Commission said lower export performance, failure of mega projects to commence production, high demand for imported goods, and growing external burden during the past years have worsened the shortage. They require $13 billion over the coming two years for oil importation, private investment, upgrading of existing projects, and for the repayment of external debt. That's a lot of money. And that's why I said about uh, Abby's uh, pivot, I said this is potentially a massive change, um, but it's a change made by necessity. Joseph Kabila isn't planning to seek another term as DR Congo's president, his prime minister says. South African oil shares down 2.18% year to date, dollar versus rand. Oh dear. Picture of the inside of a Mabari house showing a mud sculpture depicting Aya, the Earth Mother, among the Igbo. Pretty amazing, I thought. Nigeria all share up 2.42% year-to-date. Ghana Stock Exchange up 15.97% year-to-date. Tanzania, the shuttering of the news and social networking site, Jamie Forums, marks a critical juncture in President John Magufuli's crackdown on the media since coming to power in 2015. Um, it was like a kind of African WikiLeaks. The site has grown to be an influential portal that breaks stories and exposes government corruption, earning at the titles of Tanzania's Reddit, the Swahili version of WikiLeaks. But we're clearly seeing a massive clampdown in Tanzania. In Uganda, people having to pay fees to get off of Facebook. I mean, it's ludicrous. Africans could be buying $75 billion worth of goods and services online by 2025 as millennials cash in on Africa's internet addiction. This is CNN. Interesting report. And I spoke about this earlier in January when I said e-commerce and home-based deliveries have changed the world from London to China. And I am certain the same disruption is headed our way, I said. Um, uh, I said a lot of commercial real estate will be legacy assets. U.S. Secretary for, Under Secretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, Ms. Seagal Mandelker, urged Uganda and Kenya to stop South Sudan political leaders from buying property using corruption proceeds. Um, and uh, sorry, to go back to that e-commerce story, I saw a headline on Bloomberg, landlords are practically giving malls away to the, on to that point. Let's move on. Kenya has rounded up scores of officials as it tackles corruption, but not a single politician has been arrested. This is the point about patsies and the point about puppeteers and puppets. The puppets have been picked up, but the puppeteers are still at large. And until we see a puppeteer arrested, we can't take it really that seriously. Now, Ruby all shares up 4.16% year to date. Uh, but it's 9.284% below a record high set on April 5. James Moria released uh, Centum's full year results this morning. He said he expected financial closure on Amu Power, this is the coal plant, during the current financial year. Centum reported a 63.769% decline in full year earnings per share, but maintained the dividend unchanged. Full year sales we're up 8.184%. Um, uh, but then we saw uh, profit before tax down 63.979% <coughs> to 3.146 billion shillings. Net asset value, however, is going in north. That's at 73.16. So uh, just there, there's a huge discount actually on that, on that basis. Um, so dividend unchanged, 9% growth in the book value of shareholder funds, total assets up 7% at 66 billion. Group's fair value gain on its investment properties decreased by 2.3 billion shillings year on year. I'd like to see that actual number. 
uh, they have 11.38 uh, billion shillings of borrowings. Have a look at this tweet from them, Consolidated Group Revenue, 13.7 billion. They're saying the decline in profitability is attributed to lower realized gains as recognition of Gen Africa disposal gains was deferred to fully in 2019. You know, they are very adept at trading in and out. They, their results have typically had some element of trading profits. This time they did not book them. So that's why you short, saw quite a slide in the EPS. And have a look at this business review uh, infographic. They're currently active in six key sectors. Total assets have increased 2.3 times for the period fully year 14 to fully year 18. My conclusions are that they've proven extremely adept at up and down risking their projects to rivers as an optimal example, where they're in at zero now. They're going to have to upload more capital into the financial services sector. They obviously would have looked a lot sharper had they been able to book that Gen Africa disposal in full year 18. There is a monster NAB discount which buyers can lean into. So overall, I think it's a bit of a buy, especially if it dips. Equity Bank trades on a trading PE of 9.85. And what caught my attention was a significant steepening and acceleration in the subsidiary's earnings trajectory. And I think that's why I'm justifying a price substantially higher than where we are currently. The NSC 20 is down 9.55% year to date. Britam spiked 12.55% yesterday to close at 15.70. And this was all on the back of the announcement that Swiss Re was buying shares um, of this company called Plum, where Rawat, this fellow Rawat, was in a big shot in Mauritius and was forced to disgorge his shares. Peter Munger bought those shares and held them, and now apparently Swiss Re are buying them off it. Um, and it's up 17.6% in 2018. But remember, you know, this is dilutive. IFC and Africa Investor dilutive. Total Kenya rallied 3% to close at 33.50. That's rallied 42.55% year to date. Mumia Sugar down 36.4% uh, year to date at a record low 70 cents. Have a listen to my interview with Dr. Benson Way Regi of Britam. Um, I also interviewed George Odo that day um, on the occasion of the announcement of African Best Investment in Britam. I wrote a piece over the weekend about my visit to Kakuma, which was a real uh, eye opener. It's a refugee camp in the northwestern corner of uh, Kenya. Um, and then we did a, a series of uh, uh, videos uh, one of Lee Nike, who's the CEO of TransUnion Africa, very dynamic and uh, new age speaker, is the way I describe it. A forum I moderated about banking and where we are today. And then Chad Reimer, who's a senior director, talking about delivering valuable partnerships in the banking sector. So, once again, thank you for stopping by. I'm grateful.